Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> Again, having uh, that hill attack so close to us is a, oh, it's, a big benefit. Oh, yeah. Huge. Yeah. Let's see. Are we, uh, I don't know what time it is. I've lost. It uh, is uh, 10 o'clock. 10 oh, o'clock. Okay. Looking for uh, uh, Director Ringan to uh, come on. Unless he's gotten, you know, meeting fatigue and, you know, forgot about this one on a Friday. So gonna, this is Corey. I'll be uh, moderating and watching. I'll just mute myself, stand up to the side if anybody needs anything. But uh, we are we are good and live right at the moment. All right. Thank you, Corey. Don, would you like me to attempt to contact Director Ringan and see if he's having any issues? Sure, that would be great, Abby. Thank you. Morning, everybody. No, oh, there he is. Oh, okay. <clears throat> is that you, Mr. Ringan? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, I have no internet service, so I can't. I couldn't get in on Zoom, so I have to use the phone. Oh, okay. But uh, we we will work through with that then. Um, you're coming through, good and clear. Good. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Password. Um, so um, I'd like to call the wastewater committee meeting to order. Um, both directors are here. Uh, myself, David Boatwright, and uh, Mr. Ron Ringan. And um, I do not believe we have Pledge of Allegiance or uh, public forum uh, for committee meetings. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, so our, um, you know, just a, a real brief, and I know it's not agendized, but I'm sure it's on everybody's mind. Uh, Mr. Perkins was giving me a brief um, description of yesterday's uh, incident uh, with the fire on uh, West Stockton Street. Uh, Don, did you want to take just a moment or two and kind of recap that or here I can unless I don't see okay Rich can you can you chime in there and kind of give your, your first hand account because you were just down there again this morning can you give us an overview of uh, what kind of transpired and uh, what how close the fire got to the plant okay yeah sure I can um, sorry about that I was having computer issues so um, the fire got uh, really close to the plant actually um, down by the chlorine contact chamber um, it burnt up to the fence and a little bit um, inside the fence. Um, it burned up to um, the entrance to the plant. Um, um, if you guys are familiar with it, the city yard down there where they dump their leaves and all that, um, burnt all that up. It, uh, the city has a um, storage area where they keep some of their fire engines and some of their um, Christmas stuff and all that. Um, they lost a fire engine, from my understanding, a 1915 fire engine that burnt. Um, they were able to get one out. Um, the dog pound burnt down, and it burnt up towards um, the city shooting shooting range up there. That was that was spared. So it kind of burnt around that area, the the perimeter of the plant, but um, structurally and, and all that, the the wastewater plant's fine. And uh, how about the uh, power situation? I think I understand there's still no power to uh, regional. So, so correct. Currently there's, there's some power lines down there. We're running off generator power. Um, we have not heard an ETA when we will get power back. I've, I've heard it could be quite some time. So we'll be fueling up generators. We have uh, two down there. So we'll uh, be fueling those up uh, daily, if not uh, every other day. Can I uh, get a word in here? Yeah. So um, I guess that's why I don't have any internet access because they said they had no power at the, one of the towers. So it must be something in that area where the fire was is what I'm thinking. But what I wanted to throw out is now with your firsthand uh, observation and knowledge of how vulnerable 
uh, that plant could be um, would be a real good thing in my mind to put several heads together and figure out what the um, uh, vegetation and uh, landscaping is going to look like when the project's done and make sure that it's uh, really fire resistant and um, helps protect the uh, plant um, so that, you know, you don't ever have to face what you did yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, at one point we couldn't, we couldn't get into the plant. We had to uh, clear everybody out of there. So um, it, uh, the Cal Fire and, um, did a great job. Um, like I said, a lot burned down there, but um, they got on it really fast down there. So um, there should be some pictures. I believe Lisa Westbrook's going to put some pictures up on the website too. So you guys could uh, take a look at that as well. Great. And I'm sure it'll show up in the uh, ops report. Um, next month oh yeah 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 definitely thank you you're welcome yeah thank you very much uh rich uh much appreciated as far as the uh first hand report that uh <clears throat> yeah definitely you know um throughout my career time there you know driving southgate uh, a couple times a day it, it was always kind of looking at that going wow this is just really thick so kind of a mixed blessing um you know maybe you know and i feel horrible for uh those individuals that have a loss down in there but you know primarily that open space that is certainly now thinned out um you know uh, that's you know it, it was not a control burn but you know it definitely cleared some out uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you're familiar with um, down around the chlorine contact chamber. Um, all that that underbrush is gone. All those berries and that have been just inundated down there for years and years and years. That we tried to weed eat, you know, ten feet from the fence. All all that undergrowth is is gone. So it cleared it out really good. Yeah. Um, maybe something to uh, think about, Rich, would be to. Um, and I don't know if there's locating wire on it, but that mill bill of force main and uh, the outfall line, the outfall line doesn't have a tracer on it, um, but it may be a good thing to mark that if they're gonna go through and cut uh, damaged trees and things like that, just to kind of make them aware. And, um, you know, certainly an inspection for district benefit. Um, to know if there's been any potential damage or, you know, ground movement uh, that exposes anything that uh, went, went safely, and, you know, to do so. That, uh, yeah, so we were going to, you know, walk the Southgate easement. Um, you know, one of the things that, that got brought up this morning, and um, I think um, somebody made Eric Johnson aware of it, but uh, we just recently put those composite manholes back there. So we're going to take a jump back there and see how those uh, stood up to the to the fire. Yes. But um, the, uh, as far as the outfall line um, and the, the mobile force main, yeah, it's, it's on our list. We got some of those um, great um, plastic um, uh, utility markers, like you see on the side of the roadways that say sewer line below and all that. We were gonna go through there. They stand about six feet tall. So we're gonna go through there and mark all that out too. But yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah very good. Sounds like you're very well on top of it. But, uh... I, I will ask you later how the uh, composites do on an intensifier. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see how they held up. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. But, um, so um, we can move on to the number one discussion item. Um, the discussion regarding septage facility fees. Um, and... I, you know, I've started running through a refresher in my mind as far as calculating BOD being out of touch for, uh, you know, for a bit of time of retirement. <laughs> um, you know, but looking at the ops report and seeing that the number of loads at 209 and just over a half million gallons of septage waste being received at the facility for July. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, would you, would you like to take over, run some of the calculation and, 
Um, certainly, I can pitch in with the explanation of you know some of the constituents, but uh, I will turn it over to you. Okay, certainly. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to. I'm recognizing that uh, Director Ringin is um, participating via phone only. So um, what I'm going to do is, and you guys feel free, please tell me if this is not helpful, but I was planning on sharing screen to go to the spreadsheet that's used to calculate our septage fees, but we can get lost in the numbers. And, and since Director Ringin uh, isn't likely available to see this, uh, I'm going to try to articulate it verbally. And, um, and if anyone gets lost, um, we can backtrack or we can resort to just a conversation. Um, but I'll, I'll give this a shot. Bear with me here. I'm going to share screen. I have too many windows open. So just a moment. All right. Okay. Is everyone seeing a, a spreadsheet? Uh, yeah. Could you enlarge it a little bit? Possibly? Yes, I, absolutely. Uh, and let me move it over here. All right. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully you're seeing something that says current sewer rate at the top. Okay. Yes. Okay. So big picture here verbally um, is that our rate structure is intended to cover our annual O&M costs and also fund capital replacement. Um, and capital replacement is reflected in our CIP. Um, our O&M expenses are reflected in our annual operating budget. And um, we currently bill $51 a month per equivalent single family residence. This, this is related to septage, but that's what our charge is for um, our wastewater customers right now. So that $51 is supposed to cover annual O&M costs, uh, replacement of wearable parts and, and that type of thing. Plus when something reaches the end of its useful life, uh, it funds that facility's replacement. Our intention here in this, the way we calculated our septage fee was to try to get it in terms of an equivalent single family residence. So when I say that a, a, a hauler is coming in with a load and dumping a load, like what does that equate to in terms of how many homes, how many homes are getting hit at the plant? And then we back that into what the rate would be if they were a let's just say a customer discharging on a daily basis into the, into the system. And so first thing we looked at, and I will admit right off the bat and, and director Boatwright knows this, that these numbers are old. Uh, we did this in 20 late 2015 um, with our rate um, when we did our rates. And, and so things have changed quite a bit since that time. Uh, and admittedly, we would need to update all these numbers to reflect the current, what the current rate should be. Uh, but we can get into that later. The methodology is still the same. So we look at how much load the plant receives in septage back in 2014 or 2011 through 2014, the average was 3 million, you know, 100, let's say uh, 100,000 gallons of septage per year. I think now we're up about 5.7. I mean, so let's just say we've doubled. So we've doubled that average gallons per day. We've, we've doubled. Um, but back then, you know, and the numbers would all change proportionally if we, we updated these numbers, but then average gallons per load, because we're trying to calculate what do we charge for a load into the plant in terms of equivalent single family residences. So back then, you know, we were receiving an average of almost five loads per day. Uh, I think you just, Director Bo Red mentioned, we've got 200 and uh, I, I can't remember how many, 200, 209. 209, yeah, 209, let's just call it a 30 day month. You're at seven. So not quite twice, but you know, for purposes of discussion, let's just say twice as much. 
we did. Um, can I can I step in here for a minute? Sure. Um, I'd I'd like to know the reasoning of comparing septage uh, loads or whatever you want to, however you want to uh, say it. Why, why are we comparing it to single family home when when it is entirely different than what you're getting from a single family home? A single family home, you're getting uh, a lot of liquid, showers, sinks, uh, uh, along with toilet waste and so on. And with a septage truck load, you're getting concentrated much heavier uh, waste that takes way more work for the system to break down. The two, it's like comparing apples with oranges. And I don't, I don't think it's fair or right that the fees, um, I mean, it's like Patterson used to say, oh, well, it's, it's just more water. Well, no, the water went out into the leak field. Um, what you're getting is the the heavy stuff and the coating on top, the sludge on top, and um, I don't know. I, I think that needs to be rethought. And that's my opinion, anyways. No, you're 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 correct. They are different. Um, the calculation goes through several iterations to uh, equate the two and takes into account. The, the biological oxygen demand and the total suspended solids load and also the hydraulic load, which like you said, is pretty, pretty small. The other approach, which I think is justifiable, we just don't have the data and Steve can certainly speak to this, is to look at really what does it cost to operate the septage receiving facility in terms of how many man hours a day, and all of those pieces of equipment, the maintenance on those, and then also what it means to the rest of the treatment process. Um, we don't track our uh, labor and our materials and our consumables, electricity and stuff separate for the septage receiving facility. So we have an expense uh, ledger, if you will, that is related to the whole treatment plant. Now, Steve could Steve's hands up, so maybe he can elaborate. Yeah, I mean, just before we go much further, I, this is challenging. Director Ringen, I mean, your comments are right on point. Unfortunately, you don't see what we're looking at. Eric's analysis starts with that ESFR, and then what he was getting to, his next several slides, is he takes that and converts that to exactly the things you're talking about. He converts that to the BOD per load. He converts that to the TSS. He's doing everything you just said. So in his, his analysis that he was starting to walk through, and it's very difficult not seeing the screen, but if you, I think Eric was gonna go ahead and try and verbally tell you exactly how he does that. We are not basing it on an average sewer. He is basing it on the actual septage, the tested septage, and that's how we get there. But then again, as far as equating costs to it, that becomes more challenging. Even when, you know, Director Boatwright was there and the whole bit, we'd say, well, it's so many hours per day, but then the trash comes in during the fair and then it does this and that and the other. But again, for purposes of this discussion as to how we came up with our septage rates, uh, again, Eric can continue to explain how he converts those to just what you mentioned, Director Ringen, or, or whatever we're attempting to answer here. But hopefully that provides some context because you're correct, Director Ringen, but Eric has already done exactly what you're talking about. So I think he's just not gotten there yet. Bear with us. Okay, well, I appreciate the, the uh, input and I'll try to keep my mouth shut, but I just want to make sure that this thing, that everybody realizes that we almost lost that plant a couple of years ago or so because of septage. Uh, and um, there's a reason why nobody else will take that stuff anywhere around here. And 
We don't know where it's coming from. Um, we don't know what's in the load, but we, it, we take it and we do the best we can to treat it. And to me, it puts us be really between a rock and a hard place because we just don't know what it is. And so I won't say anything more. I'll just listen, but I, I hope everybody understands that this is dead serious. I mean, why, why doesn't other, um, sewer districts take it anywhere close around here we're the only ones uh, mr Ringan, i i totally agree with the uh, statements that you were <clears throat> just commenting on and i also agree with uh, mr sheffield um looking at and you know following through with uh, mr johnson's explanation of you know how we do this if you'll bear with us for just a moment or two longer, um, I think think we'll get into that. Definitely. All right. Thank you. Uh, All right. Well, um, yeah, this is an imperfect um, rate analysis. I mean, there's always improvements can be made and, and uh, the garbage and the debris and stuff, it probably isn't captured. It's a it's a, another expense that that isn't probably reflected in here, but I'm going to jump. I'm going to try to go through really quick because it gets really boring, honestly, to get into these numbers. Um, and Director Boatwright, if you want to stop and dig in because you understand um, these things very well, I'm happy to go into more detail. But basically, we took um, some samples from loads, grab samples, mind it, um, if, over a period of time. Uh, and, and David was involved in this, and, and I have this data offline here, but we determined that the average BOD in a load, which is the biological oxygen demand was somewhere around 3000 milligrams per liter. And the total suspended solids was approaching 20,000 milligrams per liter. Now compare that with the strength of our typical influent to the plant uh, from domestic wastewater. And you'll see uh, that, you know, average residential BOD, maybe around 250, uh, average residential TSS into the plant, maybe around 400. These numbers have changed a little bit, but for purposes of discussion, what we can say is when a load comes into the plant, it's like dumping six, the equivalent flow of about 54 homes at one time and the equivalent BOD of about 625 homes in one day and the equivalent of dumping like 2,500 TSS, total suspended solids loads um, in one day. The difference though, is this happens one time on one day in one year and a residence is giving the plant flow 365 days a year. So we're uh, 30 days a month, 365 days a year. So when we looked at the way we calculated the rate, we said, wow, that's a lot of strength. Um, that needs to factor in to their cost. And I used a breakdown that was used by other consultants in the industry. Uh, Mr. Johnson, can I stop you for just a second? Absolutely. Um, you know, and I totally agree with this section, um, but the uh, it, it's not one load as far as the 54 or 625 or the 2590. That, <clears throat> that's a total day dumping uh, in that section. That's the average septage flow instead of one truckload. Thank you. You are absolutely correct. Uh, down below, I converted to loads. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's the daily contribution. I'm glad you're. I'm glad I have the spreadsheet up. You, can, <laughs> you're correct. Um, so, this strength, which is reflected in BOD and TSS, has to enter into our rate or our fee. I should say I should be calling it a fee, not a rate. And we use a breakdown of 60% of the fee would be associated with the strength in BOD and TSS and 40% of our fee would be related to the actual flow. I don't know if this is a great breakdown. I mean, to me, I think 
my gut tells me that the strength to be should be even a greater than 60% of the fee and the flow should be less. But as I said before, I, I took this as work that other consultants had done in the industry that know more about this than I do and, uh, and applied it here. Uh, if we go back around and reevaluate our fees, I, I think that we should revisit this. But so we get down and, and I'll reiterate uh, kind of what David was getting at is um, the, the strength is in terms of total strength per load, it's roughly the equivalent of 147 ESFRs, homes, being dumped into the plant at one time. That's, that's basically what we're looking at. And that has tremendous impact through the entire plant, not just the septage receiving facility, because it's a, a shock load that then has to be processed through the secondary process and into the as solids handling implications and disinfect, disinfection implications. That becomes the basis. So 147 ESFRs. And then here's another imperfection, but this is the way we did it. In 2015, when we did our rates, this was what was associated with the treatment and disposal process at the plant, which is what we're looking at, Director Ringen, is when our uh, wastewater rates were around $32 per ESFR, or I can't remember what they were back in 2015 before we raised the rates, um, about $17 of that was associated with the treatment process. We certainly can't charge the septage haulers for maintenance of our collection system, maintenance of our sewer lift stations. We can charge them for maintenance, operations of maintenance of the treatment and the reclamation system because they impact the reclamation. And so that was about $17 per month per ESFR. And yet we agreed that each load's about 147 ESFRs. And that translates to a load cost of 85, roughly $85 just for like O&M, general O&M. But it doesn't capture, and I'm scrolling down, you can't see this, doesn't capture two important elements. One, replacement of wear items. I mean, expensive wear items, such as, you know, uh, some of the screening and some of the motors and some of those things that David knows all about. We plugged in $25,000 a year. It's probably grossly inefficient, but that's what we did. And we looked at how many loads a year we were receiving and how much per load we would have to recover in cost for those that $25,000 expense each year. That was roughly $15 per load. So we're now adding what was up above $85. We're now adding 15, right? We're now at $100 per load and we haven't factored in any capital replacement cost. How, how did we look at the capital replacement? Well, we assumed we were going to replace the existing facility like for like. Again, an imperfect assumption, but um, we invested almost half a million dollars in 1996 when we, uh, I think we hired HDR to design it. And I wasn't here, uh, but uh, the, a lot of work was done that formed the basis for our current septage receiving facility. And we, took that cost, assuming we were just going to replace like for like, and brought it up to present day dollars using an annual inflation of 3%, which means that that project in today's dollars or $2015 would have been $865,000. Um, and then that $865,000 has to be recovered over the life of the facility. So we used 40 years. You could say, well, we haven't collected enough um, since 1996 when it was built and it only has, let's just say it only has 10 more years of useful life. We're going to have to accelerate our, our recovery. Um, but we used 40 years as the useful life, which means over 40 years, it would receive 67,000 loads if our load count didn't go up. And that's roughly $13 per load. So we had $85 a load, 
for O&M, general O&M, $15 for replacement of wear items and $13 for capital replacement of the facility, which gives us $113 per load. Um, that's since been increased every year, um, depending on inflation in the engineering news and record cost index. And so our current charge is $131 per load, which is it's gone up 19% over the last five years. Um, and then that's assuming a base load of 1,500 uh, gallons, but we know that the loads are more than that. And uh, so there's also a charge per gallon above 1,500 because we have to have some limit. I mean, somebody can't come in and dump, you know, 15,000 gallons into the plant and just pay the same base load charge. Um, and that was captured uh, up above in our spreadsheet, which you can't see. Um, it amounts to 10%, 10 cents per gallon above 1,500 gallons. And so that's really how we came up with our, um, our current charges. I think they are low. Uh, they're low if we look across the marketplace at what other places charge. They're low because I believe there's, well, one, less uh, useful life left in the facility as we know we're gonna replace it. Um, and I think the impacts of strength to the plant should be more than 60%. So when we factor all of those in, I think this number will go up quite a bit, but we are building a new facility that will have a new labor uh, you know, cost associated with it, new electricity expense. Uh, it will be able to handle uh, garbage and debris much better than this facility. It will have um, you know, a different cost basis and that may be a time to really recalculate the, the fees and bring them up to, to current. Otherwise, you know, we, we could change our fees now. We could certainly do that, but we will need to change them again in about 18 months to two years when we complete the new plant. Um, Hopefully that gives you guys enough of a general feel for how the, the fees came up. Yeah, Eric, Eric I have a question. Um, you know, one big flaw I see um, the difference between 10 cents and the eight cents um, for number of gallons over um, 1500. You know, the, the impacts and the O&M, you know, for the treatment plant, it, it really doesn't change. Um, and that amount, you know, if a truckload was 3,000 gallons, that amounts to, you know, basically $30. <clears throat> I, I can say that I really don't agree with a, you know, discount on, on the quantity there. Um, it, it almost should be the same um, price all the way through a truck that may have been, you know, kind of insignificant when the truck size, um, you know, in the 90s, and up through, you know, maybe 2004, uh, the truck sizes or load size that we were dealing with, <clears throat> you know, the trucks were only 15 to 1800 gallons as far as size. <clears throat> I would say the majority of the trucks out there now are 28 to 3300 gallons in size. Um, you know, that, that, that should definitely be looked at. Um, you know, and I'll wait for uh, Mr. Sheffield to, you know, maybe, you know, give us some insight as to our, our, our costs current for the way we're currently calculating, um, you know, such as um, sludge disposal uh, and <clears throat> electricity and all that. Are we staying current with uh, today's cost um, for that? Um, <clears throat> well, um, you know, David, I will say, uh, I totally agree. Totally agree. There is, I, I agree. There's a flaw there. <laughs> um, I think, uh, a 3000 gallon load would be somewhere around $280 now. And, uh, and that, uh, yeah, I think there's many ways we, this could, would go up if we were to redo the numbers just today, um, with the current information we have. 
but Steve probably can address the financial question you had. Yeah, I mean, it, as far as your finance director and looking at this, clearly I, I'm, I'm not an operator. I'm not wastewater knowledgeable like you are, David. Um, I'm not an engineer. I remember back in 2014, uh, we went through this capacity fee for water. Uh, 2014, I believe uh, Eric did this, this charge analysis for capacity fees for sewer. Those, those kind of calculations should be updated probably every five years. Um, just like our basic sewer and water rates uh, need to be updated. Now, one of the big things we've been talking about is we're building a brand new plant. And so, you know, some of Director Ringen's concerns from, from this old finance director, it's kind of a matter of, you know, first and foremost, are, are, are we serving this much septage right now? You know, does us having whatever the total was, Eric, five, what was it, 5.7 million? Um, you know, is, is that, is our system right now able to keep that? That would be my biggest concern. If we can't take that, then we need to reduce the amount of sewage. Now, if the matter is, hey, we're building a brand new sewer plant, I've asked a couple of times, will this brand new sewer plant be able to handle this much sewer plus more? Everybody's told me, absolutely, it'll do more. So does charging more of our existing rates help us out if we have too much sewer? I don't think so. Um, and, and again, the basic premise we operate in, all fees we, we charge people should be based on the cost to operate. And, and I think Eric's done that. Now this question of 1,500 gallons per load or take it up to 3,000 gallons or whatever, I think that's a good point that needs to be looked at. But for me, it's a real timing issue. You know, if this plant's gonna be a reality in two years, 18 months to two years, boy, that's a whole new world. Once we get it going and we're doing this, then, then great, you know, we can figure out the cost and do that. The real challenge right now is, is how do you separate you know, a, a regular home and collection and everything else goes from specifically the operation of the septage. I, you know, my recommendation is that we get this new plant in place and then we do a complete analysis of septage costs and everything else. Now, some of the other suggestions or concerns that, that Director Ringen brought up and others have in there is that it's my understanding that some of our neighboring counties, they made a decision, we just don't want septage, period. Whether anybody takes it or not, you can drive to the Bay Area, you can drive somewhere else. Well, certainly this board could say the same thing. Do we want to keep doing septage? If we have a brand new facility that can take septage, do we want to take septage? Sure, we'll keep doing it. If you don't, tell us and, and we won't build that, won't have that part of it. Then you say, well, do we want to service anybody outside our area? If we can take in additional gallonage, you know, the person who brings in the Calaveras uh, septage is a local business owner. They're the same ones. It's the same business, the same hauler that's here in Tuolumne County is there. And so do we want to service them? If we don't want to service them, I mean, they're clearly contributing to the revenue that goes into our septage system. So, you know, I think, I think the board needs to look at what's the goals and objectives here. Do we want to reduce the amount of septage we're treating? Do we want to treat it more effectively? Do we, you know, are we recovering costs? I don't think we have the ability just to say we want a bigger profit on here because we're not a profit entity. And I don't think we can distinguish that uh, septage coming from outside is any costlier to process or do than any septage in county. Um, but again, that's just my finance observations. But back to what you said, Director Boatwright, you know, the, the cost of wastewater has gone up like uh, all other costs. Uh, we don't have the ability to directly relate it solely to the operation of the septage facility. But I think, uh, you know, we do know how much revenue we're bringing in. Um, we do know uh, the sewer costs, the board recently adopted the budget for the sewer for the next year. And we do know we're going to build a plant. And that plant in includes a rather robust improvement to the whole septage uh, situation. So I'd be happy to answer any questions or provide further information. 
Yeah, I totally agree with you, Steve. Um, I, I don't think our concerns for the septage receiving facility, uh, facility um, they're not based in a, you know, going after a profit. Um, it's more of wanting to be assured that <clears throat> the normal collection system, uh, the single ESFR in our collection system is, is not subsidizing um, our operation of uh, receiving septage waste from, uh, you know, on-site sewer disposal systems. Um, <clears throat> with that being said, um, certainly, you know, as a new treatment plant comes online, <clears throat> And I would like certainly mm -hmm. like us to take a look at, you know, um, through our engineering company for the new plant as to the cost of, you know, treating BOD in the new system. It, it will be radically different than uh, our current treatment system. Um, and we will be cleaning water to a higher standard. And, you know, there, there will be a substantial increase in, you know, O&M, um, you know, as far as power and some of these other things. Um, Mr. Ringan, do you have a, uh, any other questions? I, I know you're definitely challenged uh, with not being able to see the graphics, the, you know, the spreadsheet we were just looking at. Yeah, but I think that uh, between... Um... Eric and Steve Sheffield, I'm, um, and your comments too. I, I, I have a pretty clear picture. The, the one thing that irks me, and I'll just be straight up about this, is that with everything that's been said, yes, we're building a new uh, treatment plant. Yes, it's going to be able to uh, be way better uh, in many, many ways, especially with a uh, for the septage haulers and so on. But it was born on the backs of the TUD sewer ratepayers. I mean, we're, we're talking 40 million some odd dollars and I have, uh, Steve Sheffield has figure there right in front of him, I'm sure, of what TUD's portion of it was. And what, what irks me is that Calaveras County, somehow Patterson let them off the hook. They should have been involved in the septage portion of that because that's where a lot of the trucks come from. And I'm not against, or do I want to hurt the septage haulers business because it's vital to the real estate trade and also the health and safety of our communities. But I, I just don't think it's right for the TUD ratepayer to take it in the neck totally in order to do this. I, I just, I, to me, it, it, and that's why I think there should be a separate I think, charge for septage that comes from Tuolumne County because that's who we serve. And if it comes from a whole different uh, Mr. Ringan, we, we lost you a little bit there at the end. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I, it's, I knew this was going to be difficult. I guess I'll just tag on to, to Director Ringen's uh, question for the benefit of the group. You know, we, we don't have a mechanism to exactly know how much is in county or out of county, but over the past 10 years, I've tried to collect as much data as possible. And, and our current estimate is that 30% of the septage comes uh, from out of county, but like I said, it, it is a, a hauler that is in county, comes from out of county, and you know that the the calculation that Eric showed is our way to have them contribute to the cost of this. And I understand what he's saying. There was talk at one time about forming a JPA uh, with Calaveras or other agencies for the septage hauling, but. You know, quite frankly, there it's like everything else we do. All the governmental agencies have same problems, and they didn't want any part of it. You know, the, the, the question could be that, well, we just won't do it at all and let it go somewhere else. But, you know, we approached other agencies. Uh, we tried that. Uh, there was so little response, and we didn't want to hold up the regional plant uh, on this. But, 
you know, that's that's the reality is I'd love to have these other agencies involved, but they don't have to. We can't make them legally. Um, and if they don't want to form it and we had to proceed and we found a way to do it without increasing rates to our rate payers, uh, they will to continue to do that. But, you know, the board could certainly entertain the idea of just saying, you know what, Calvers, you don't want to participate. We're not going to take your stuff anymore. I mean, that's certainly an option in here, but then I don't know how would we be able to enforce that and go forward. Um, and, and again, I don't know how we could support a direct charge just because they are out of county. That would take some uh, research with the legal side of that. You know, the basic premise we operate on under our California Water Code is that what we charge uh, has to be the same if the costs are the same. So generally, if you have a different class of citizen or a different residency for this type of fee, uh, there really isn't a cost differential. So uh, I, I hear you, Director Ringen, loud and clear. I, I would have liked us to have a JPA for this facility, but you know it just wasn't going to pan out. And we wanted to take advantage of the USDA opportunity to bring this treatment plant to this community. So my thoughts. Hope that that helps to the conversation and understanding. Thank you, Steve. If you if you don't mind, I'd like to uh, chime in here too. Uh, you know, Eric Johnson, you know, I've seen you uh, uh, go through this spreadsheet many times over the years, and each and every time I'm, I'm very uh, impressed and I'm thankful that you took the time to do just that. It's, I guess it's re it can be really easy to, you know, five years or six years down the road, maybe poke holes in it and maybe not. But, you know, that can, the same can be said in just about everything we do. We, you know, we try to build a better mousetrap each and every time we, we go through uh, these sorts of things. So, um I, what I'm most interested in in this uh, process is uh, is uh, just kind of an awareness of where we were in the 90s when we first brought on this facility, this, this septage uh, facility, uh, and and where we've been and, and and where we're at now. So, I think I heard you guys talk that uh, in this last month we had 209 loads of septage facility. Uh, sep is that about right? 209 is that what I heard? Uh, I just, that's, that's what the operations report says. Yeah, so I just quickly went back to 2016. That's as far back as my operation reports go. And and at that month, it was 144 loads. And I remember talking and looking back in time how that was a dramatic increase from, say, five years before that. So the, the number of loads and the, the number of gallons being received is definitely going up. And I don't know where if when it's going to peak. Um, that facility just, in my estimation, David, you were here for this, but in my estimation, the facility that was that was designed and constructed and built there, I don't think was intended to receive this amount of loads per day. And then the other thing that I don't think we've touched on most, I, much, but down the road I'd like to touch on is uh, the amount of trash. I mean, there's just, there's more garbage associated with these loads than ever before. Am I correct about that, David? And before you answer, and again, that that facility, that machine was just not meant to pull tennis shoes and two by fours and Coke bottles and air mattresses and everything else that comes along with it. Yeah. Um, you know, certainly the, the, there are different, you know, human waste facilities uh, that are addressed through the uh, septic hauling uh, companies. Certainly, if you look at our forest uh, pit toilets, um, they're, they're wide open, you know, uh, they're basically just a vault, holds for a period of time. Um, certainly, there are, you know, <clears throat> the immediate need for uh, temporary uh, porta potties uh, facilities. Uh, certainly, when we get in the area, a, you know, uh, base camp for a forest fire or wildland fire, <clears throat> you know, we get companies that literally call us and say, hey, you know, over the next three weeks or so, I'm going to need to be hauling 30,000 gallons a day. <clears throat> the loads kind of vary a little bit, um, you know, as far as the concentration of BOD strength. Uh, when you get these heavier garbage loads, or more debris in these loads of oddball items that shouldn't be in there. Certainly, you know, a normal residence is not going to flush a two by four. 
Um, you know, a child may try and flush a, a tennis shoe. Um, certainly, you know, we see our other odd stuff, just GI Joes, the Hot Wheels, um, occasional golf ball. You know, it, these are items that come in. Um, cell phones, um, you know, uh, back before the 1990s, I don't think I've seen any cell phones being flushed into the regional plant. Um, but today, they occasionally come through as well. Um, but yes, uh, definitely the, you know, beginning point of where the load comes from certainly affects the amount of debris uh, that's going to be in the, you know, load as it dumps into the treatment plant. Um, <clears throat> you know, the combi unit, uh, high core combi unit, that's the, you know, main portion of the facility up there. Um, over the years, I, I always said that, you know, that's the only machine that I know of that could actually handle nearly that much debris. But the problem is we have to work the machine, i.e. when it's a heavier load, you know, um, the drivers usually know it. Uh, some of them got in the habit of, hey, uh, I'm going to be coming in in an hour and a half, um, and I've got a really bad load. Is there any way anybody can, you know, kind of meet to help? Um, you know, so there was some cooperation uh, coming on there. Um, how's the facility continuing to operate, Don? Yeah. Uh fine uh it's not it's not much different than when you, you remember there are some wear items that are uh given given us fits in fact not long ago i think that you call it the grit pacifier screw or screen or something along those lines that gave us some fits and will and, and the boys had to go down there with jeremy and help fabricate a repair on it and they were kind of holding their fingers crossing their fingers but in the end it sounds like it's working just fine okay all right well good um you know, and, you know, I, I'm kind of satisfied that, you know, we've met the criteria that we're, you know, looking at, you know, the septage uh, fees to make sure that we're staying current and, you know, making sure that the operational costs, you know, are covered uh, with, for that type of waste coming into the treatment plant. Uh, Mr. Ringan, um, do you have any other comments? No, I'm... Uh, no, this has been very um, informative, and I think um, it's laid a bunch of uh, things out on the table that uh, make everybody aware that there are some things that we need to work on um, as the new plant comes online. And um, this is probably one of those things that uh, to be continued. Um, any m members of the public uh, wish to comment or have a question? Okay. Um, Mr. Perkins, um, do you feel this discussion has led us towards, um, is there any review of the full board needed, you know, for this or where would we be at a point that we would need to bring it to the full board for a fee adjustment or discussion? Yeah. yeah, I think, uh, I think the way I feel and understand is I think you know, definitely you should, uh, uh, update the board on this meeting and on, on this topic. But as far as I think I understand is, uh, internally, uh, we can work on what, what some new fees might look like, you know, once the new treatment plant comes online, uh, so that we have something developed. Soon thereafter. Does that sound about right, which is two years away or so? Yeah, um, I would certainly think it's worth uh, a bit of time to scrutinize the fees and make sure that all our costs are current. Um, and then if there's a differential in our current fees versus what the facility is costing us to operate, um, certainly that, that would be worthwhile bringing to the full board. And, you know, I will go through and uh, talk uh, with the other board members at our next uh, meeting as far as opening up. Great. Thank you. I agree with you, David. That's what we'll do. Appreciate right. it. Um, very good. Um, and, uh, next item. Uh, I think this is pretty exciting. Um, 
massive project to build an entirely new sanitary sewer treatment plant. Um, I'm excited to, you know, see, you know, how this project contributes. And, you know, I, I feel it deserves a little bit of pomp and circumstance as far as a groundbreaking. What would be the time frame uh, that we'd be looking at um, that the construction first day or just prior to that could start? Yeah, I think coincidentally, uh, Eric Johnson was thinking the same thing. I think he has some ideas on a, a, an appropriate date. I'm super excited as well. It's, uh, yeah, we've done uh, ceremonies for much smaller projects for much less. That's for sure. So I, I'm glad you brought this up. This is spot on. I think we should do something. And um, the contractor, I'm sure, is 100% on board uh, with that. Their Kiwit. Infrastructure West is pretty sophisticated. They're used to dealing with agencies that, that would do uh, groundbreaking ceremonies, that would do PR type events, that uh, would certainly do tours. Um, so uh, I know that uh, they, they'd be on board with that. We met with them coincidentally yesterday about an hour. We, we terminated our, our uh, meeting about an hour before the fire broke out. And um, they furnished to us their initial schedule, very rough draft. So none of the dates that I have are firm, but I can tell you that their schedule has them moving in, um, looking at it right now, mobilizing equipment on the 27th of September. So uh, about a month from now. Um, so that third, fourth week in, December, in September, uh, we'll start seeing some activity down there. And, and then they have, right after they mobilize some equipment, they're going to be grading and putting their office uh, in and um, getting temporary fencing up and getting themselves situated uh, there on site. And so it might make sense to do some type of groundbreaking while technically there would be some earthwork done before to, to grade and level out areas for their uh, trailers, um, it might make sense to do it after they have their offices on site because they usually put up signs. Um, USDA will probably want to sign too. I haven't just popped into my mind, you know, that they're a big funding uh, partner in this. And uh, that would be a good photo op kind of place uh, when we do the, the groundbreaking. Uh, so I'm just thinking toward the very end of September or very beginning first week of October is probably the opportunity we would have. I think Jennifer's on too. So Jennifer, if you have a different idea, please chime in, but that's, uh, that's their current schedule right now. And then just for your information, they think they can uh, get this project done in 18 months. We originally had thought it was closer to two years, but because Kiwit's such a large company and they self-perform, uh, many of the trades, including the electrical, they aren't going to be waiting to schedule with their subcontractors. They can internally within the company allocate resources as needed to maintain the, the work schedule. Uh, so open to discussion and suggestion about how uh, the board or the committee would like to proceed. Um. I, I'm not sure. I, it, it looks like we've lost Director Ringan. Uh oh, that's correct. It looks like he has dropped off. Oh, bummer. <laughs> um, it, it, it sounds great. Um, and, and certainly, you know, even in the few days following, as uh, you know, large equipment and different things are moving in. I totally agree with you, Mr. Johnson. That. Uh, to have our signs up and our uh, funding sources noted and all that. <clears throat> oh, um, Mr. Ringan, are, are you back with us? It does look like he's on. Yes. <clears throat> uh, Director Ringan, can you hear us? Yes, okay. I'm here. I gotta love cell phones. Um, yeah, uh, um, Mr. Johnson was just touching on uh, it was looking towards the end of September. Did you catch that portion of conversation? 
Yeah, I did. Okay. Um, that sounds good. <clears throat> all right. Um, very good. Um, definitely, Mr. Perkins, um, I, I think you have the full direction of the committee for we would like to see a groundbreaking ceremony for this project. Exactly. So I got a silly question, I think. Do you do you want the big giant scissors and red ribbon or do you want uh, five golden shovels? Or what do you want? Something like that. Um, you know, I, I think it's the five golden shovels for the start. The ribbon cutting or the valve opening come comes at the uh, at the other end. Months. Yeah, months later. You got it. Looking forward to it. Uh, yeah. Uh, that'll you know two very exciting days for this project. But, uh, Maybe I can get to uh, Terry Hyler to come back and uh, make some golden shovels for us. He'd love to do that. <laughs> Thank you. All right, sounds good. Um, any other uh, comments or questions on that? I'll I'll work with the contractor um, and uh, target some dates, and so they'll be they'll be prepared and um, have. You know, the equipment will be there, which also provides some context and good photos to demonstrate, you know, the work is actually beginning. And um, we can also, if the board, if it's the board's pleasure, coordinate that with um, an overview of the, the project itself. Just as a reminder, we did a tour of the wastewater plant, you know, and Director Boatwright, you were there when we did our uh, pre-bid uh, meeting. But... I don't think the board as a whole has had an opportunity to put boots on the ground and really see the layout and where these facilities will be other than just uh, via Zoom and on, on paper. So we might take advantage of that as well. But yeah. we'll work with the contractor and I'll take direction from Don and, and the board on how we want to lay this out probably uh, end of September, beginning of October. All right. Very good. Thank you. Uh, item number three, update on operation and maintenance of the reclamation system. But, uh, I'm going to let, uh, if, unless you want to start us off, David, I was going to have uh, Rich um, uh, give us uh, his breakdown. Uh, I, I think uh, any input I have may come under item four. Okay. Um, and, um, you know, as far as a little bit of history. Um, yeah, just uh, current status, uh, how we're doing out there and uh, how the uh, season is progressing for us. So um, right now, quartz level today is uh, 16.2 feet, um, which roughly about 8% of um, capacity left. Um, we are currently um, running... Uh, getting water down to courts and out to the ranchers. Um, Tuesday through Saturday, uh, we um, turn that 154 horsepower pump off on Sunday, Monday, and um, open up the six inch control valve. So all the water's going to courts. Um, so the lower zone and the upper zones, um, both will not be watering um, those two days. Um, we have talked about going to, not talked about, we will at some point go to the um, rotating schedule like we did Director Boat right back in um, October of 2014. Um, so in, in, that, in that year, um, we were able to get water into um, October. Um, we're hopeful to do that again. Um, the staff is, is doing everything, everything we can to get as much water out there um, as as possible. So, um, you have any specific questions for me or concerning uh, that? Maybe a little bit of clarification. Um, okay, you, you said sixteen o two or sixteen two o for current um, level of quartz. Sixteen point two o. Oh, okay. So that, that's a total. Um, yeah, that's not an elevation. That's actually staff level of the reservoir. Yes, correct. Okay, so that equates then you're um, certainly into the reserve pool. Um, has there been any challenges for the floating pump um, removing water or putting water into the system? Um, no, not as of, as of yet. Um, it seems to be working out really well. Um, 
we have a, a timer set out there now. So um, it turns on a specific time, off at a specific time. Uh, the pump's been um, the pump's been working great. Um, staff's been in um, contact with um, the the users out there. So, uh, like I said, I I feel it's going good. I mean, obviously we would we would like to have more water, you know, at this point. But um, like I said, we're we're doing everything we can to get as much water down to courts and into the system as, as possible. David, one thing I think you'd be interested to note that when we did fire up the the, the, the RAP pump in the beginning, that the, the, the drive needed a little bit of a, a update or upgrade on the tuning because it just wasn't quite set right. So, but uh, uh, Frank and Justin and, and Rich and those guys got down there and got it fired up. So, but it's, it's operating just fine now. And like Rich mentioned, we have a little time clock down there. So it starts and stops automatically. And, People are checking on it regularly, so it's it's operating fine. Okay. Um, any, any problems with the distribution system? If you're, uh, I mean, basically when you uh, somebody have to be there for the startup to monitor how the reservoir and the pipeline are reacting to filling. Um, no, we haven't. Um, originally, there was somebody there because we had to do it manually, but. Um, we haven't had any issues with the, the pipeline, um, any damage to the pipeline or issues filling that upper reservoir or, or anything like that. Yeah. You know, another thing that, that did happen, David, you want to know when we first fired it up, I wasn't down there, obviously, but I, rem I remember hearing that the, uh, the screen around the, the outlet, the, the cage, uh, it, uh, it, it was compromised. So I had to stop operation and, uh, Gadiel and, uh, and and Will and those guys fabricated a new one and it's working just fine. Oh. We yeah. have a uh, person on the line, Donnie. Uh, it, it's actually Nathan Rosasco. Oh. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good morning, Nathan. Go ahead. How are we doing, John? Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Hey, I just wanted to look one of the clarification. Uh, they're running the pump five days a week, but it runs from six to four in the afternoon. That's not 24 seven. Okay. Cause that's a bit, that's a large difference. That's 10 hours a day compared to it. It makes it sound like you guys are running it for five full days. You're not, you're running it from six in the morning till four in the afternoon. And one of the problems I've ran into is because you guys have no check valves on your main valves. I have a valve one, one of my, and David, you helped me work on it. One of my old check valves has been stuck open. So if I'm not here to shut one of my valves down, my water's going back to John Gardella. It's back flowing through the system. And it's something we're gonna have to address. I'll probably replace my check valves, but you guys have never had check valves on your valves, which I find that kind of different because I've never seen too many places where they don't have a check valve at the end, on the other side of their valve so water can't back flow through the system. Okay, so I just wanted to make that clarification Thank you. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, thanks for clearing that up. Yeah, I think we skimmed right over the fact that we we're only running uh, 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., but that was the, the reason for that time clock. Uh, yeah, and I also understand we have some uh, distribution problems out there like this check valves, uh, and uh, we have a plan in place, uh, you know, uh, after the season is over, we'll get a crew down there and work on these, these, uh, the, the distribution system and the valves and check valves and such. Yeah, well, I, I'm planning on, I'll replace, David helped me work on that one check valve years, I don't know, some years back, David, you remember the old check valve. And so it, it evidently sticking open again. So it's, it's just that I have to be there. I, I, when the pump goes down, I have to be there to shut that one valve off. My other valve I can leave open, but that one there, because I, I happened to catch it one day uh, overnight and I lost about two acre feet of water back through the system, okay? So that was my point that I wanted to make. I appreciate it. Thank you, Nathan. We appreciate it too. Um, any anything else as far as their um, the O and M on on the reclamation system? No, it just uh, you know, like I said, we were we were going. Uh, you went on mute, Rich. 
Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah. So not too much on him out there that, that I, that I'm aware of. Um, we had to, uh, we spent a day out there, um, at Gardell's at that, that pump out there, um, had a check valve out there that went bad. Um, so the guys are out there, like I said, for about a day working on that. Um, we were going down there about an hour a day, uh, turning on that pump, turn it off. So that timer helped out a lot, saved a, an hour a day, which, you know, that seemed like a big deal, but it adds up. And then, um, that enables us to spend more time doing other, other O&M and other areas. Um, you know, um, my only, you know, word of caution or, uh, kind of looking at it, uh, certainly the air entrapment, uh, or entrainment, um, as you shut off, uh, certainly the air relief valves would need to be gone through to make sure that they're all operating throughout that <clears throat> lower zone. Um, otherwise you, you could definitely run into some problems. Yeah. But, uh, good point. Thank you, David. We'll, uh, we'll jot that down and make sure that's part of our, our SOPs yeah. in some way. Um, Mr. Ringan, do you have any comments or questions? Uh, actually, I do. Um, just one. Um, and that is, how is Jamestown Sanitary Sewer uh, District contributing to clean with court being below, are, is, are they a or no? Um, me, uh, Mr. Johnson, do you want me to take that? <laughs> um, Mr. Ringan, the uh, Jamestown Sanitary Treatment Plant um, actually contributes directly to Quartz Reservoir. Um, so there wouldn't be <clears throat> any um, you know, operational changes or ways to <clears throat> change that. So it sounds as if that's going to quartz storage, um, you know, or continuing to quartz storage 724. Okay, well, I mean, that's a good thing. And that, that's what I was hoping to hear is that, um, you know, with their new treatment plant and all that, that it's uh, business as usual, so to speak. But um, uh, it's very concerning to see that uh, quartz is this low, and um, um, <clears throat> it is what it is. I mean, we're all in a drought. We're all getting dried up, and it's throughout the entire system, and it's unfortunate that that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Perkins, is the Jamestown Sanitary District online with their new treatment plant now? They are. Um, well, I forget the exact start date, but I bet it's been a couple of months now. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, any comment to their water quality or how that, uh, <clears throat> you know, their new tie-in is working? You know, I I, I uh, know nothing about their their new treatment system. I you know they're I I. I no, I just don't know anything about how their plant's going. I don't know if they've had uh, bugs. I imagine they had a few bugs to work out. You know how it is when you fire up a new anything. There's a lot of bugs to work out. But, boy, I haven't heard any uh, anything uh, bad out of them, so I'm assuming it's running just time, just fine. Yeah. Well, hopefully at some moment in time, um, you know, we're invited back to, you know, see how their treatment plant is operating uh, for a tour. Um, <clears throat> great to hear that they're online. Um, yeah. and all that so yeah I, th I think patty is, is anxious to you know find it uh when it's nice and when it's safe uh, to get people you know like us out there to go take a tour of the plant so i'll reach out to her we'll reach out to her and see if we can find a time to get a tour yeah certainly we are the wastewater committee would you know love to uh be apprised of the date and time and you know there may be some other uh members of the public and board that, you know, may wish to be there as well. But, uh, you got it. I will reach out to Patty and get that done. David, I, I can just uh, let you know that they, I believe last week or the week before, the regional board adopted the new WDRs, AKA their discharge permit for the plant. And so they just got their permit literally a couple weeks ago. And then their Title 22 report is, uh, 
um, being reviewed and I think very close to being accepted. So they'll be able to operate their tertiary. They have a, a small portion of their plant that will produce a tertiary effluent that people could go up and you know, they'll have a filling station. Um, and they're still waiting on that Title 22 report approval before they can make that water available to the public. But I don't know to your question how, what the water quality is like uh, at the plant. Um, I think we have a meeting with Patty uh, in, well, I think next week. So I'll, I'll ask her how that's going. Uh, yeah, very good. Um, any members of the public uh, wish to comment on the operations maintenance of the reclamation system? Not that I'm seeing now. All right. All right. Item number four. Um, <clears throat> you know, th this one comes fully charged um, with uh, emotions and, and all that as well, too. Um, discussion regarding development of a policy for augmenting reclamation water supply. Um, so I think Mr. Ringan and myself, uh, we had a telephone call um, uh, just between the two of us. And, you know, where we both decided we were at is, is we have no knowledge of, you know, how you start to develop a policy. Um, and how that goes along. Certainly, um, <clears throat> you know, what he and I discussed and, you know, Mr. Ringan can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, you know, we wanted to see the system balanced um, so that we have, you know, enough acreage to take care of quartz reservoir water storage in years that, you know, it fills on us uh, due to extra storm water or, you know, potentially increases of flow uh, from the two treatment plants. Um, and, you know, supplementing, um, you know, a small amount of that storage capacity, you know, in years of drought or running dry, so that, <clears throat> you know, our, um, our partners in our reclamation system, uh, Mr. Gardella, Mr. Rosasco, um, you know, can know that they have a balance of, you know, water supply. Um, I think it's been a good partnership uh, from the late 70s uh, through now that uh, our surface disposal system, uh, our recycled water reclamation system, you know, has a, um, you know, beneficial end use. Um, so, uh, Mr. Ringan, would you like to comment at this time? Um, yeah, I'll just make a brief comment. Um, <clears throat> I, I agree with what you just said. Um, I think that <clears throat> um, one of the things that we discussed was this new contract with the golf course. Um, and I don't want to get down that road um, too far, but it was something that I wasn't ever really thrilled about. Um, I didn't know how, how in the world TUD was going to be able to do that. Um, and it was kind of ran through uh, by uh, Patterson and three board members. But be that as it may, uh, as you mentioned just a minute ago, the um, reclamation water users have been um, really good partners with us for many years and helped TUD take care of an, an issue that was a big issue, and that was getting rid of the MPDS permit and um, being able to recycle, do something good, positive with the um, uh, effluent coming out of the plant. Um, trouble is we're all in a drought, a big drought, second one, and it's drying up the system. And unfortunately, what's happened is because we had uh, plenty of water in past years that would almost overflow quartz, now we're at the 
the dregs. We're at the bottom of the barrel. And as a result, uh, their business operations are being um, adversely affected. And um, I don't know what the answer is to it. Uh, I'm not, you know, I mean, short of uh, waving a magic wand and having us get back to normal winners and that sort of thing. Um, I, I don't, I don't really know what the answer is, but um, uh, I think that we should spend whatever thinking and, and uh, problem solving we can in order to keep them uh, in enough water that they can still run their businesses. Cause this is an agricultural County, believe it or not, not, it isn't anymore, but it should be. This is a County that used to grow all the food that went to Bodie. And now um, it's nothing close to that. So at any rate, that's my two cents worth. And I'm looking forward to a, a robust discussion on this. That, um, you know, and I think the contract for um, the tribe and, and not getting into any examination of any details, you know, the use of that acreage um, in my mind does come into play. Um, certainly you need <clears throat> enough acreage that there is no question at all. Quartz Reservoir elevation on April 15th is going to be at the four foot of uh, freeboard. And we have a, you know, a potential surplus of recycled water available. And certainly having enough acreage to draw that all the way back down to make sure that we have wet season storage. Um, you know, I certainly think that is a um, you know, they, that's the way it should be operating. Um, starts up somewhere in, in and around April 15th and then somewhere around October 15th, it's prepared and ready to go into wet season storage of our recycled water. Um, <clears throat> certainly the new treatment plant um, is going to increase the water quality a little bit. Um, there <clears throat> should be a, you know, substantial, you know, somewhere between a moderate to a substantial reduction in the nutrients. Um, so it, that will reduce odors and, you know, some, some of the sediments that are currently in pipelines uh, will be greatly reduced over time. Um, <clears throat> the uh, main questions we have is, you know, how do we develop a policy uh, to look at that? Um, certainly, um, Mr. Perkins, I heard you mention that we have a couple of wells, uh, the racetrack well um, that is contributing. <clears throat> That's also a beneficial one to the collection system uh, for odors in the neighborhood uh, to actually run that flushing uh, to keep that area flowing down through. Um, <clears throat> I was actually wondering about, you know, and maybe we toss out a few ideas of how we would get the water down there or where supplemental water would, you know, come from. Uh, I was wondering about the Melvilla well, um, <clears throat> you know, and potentially actually setting that up to discharge directly into the reclamations pipeline. Um, Instead of, you know, running it down, I, I know we can run a certain amount of, you know, the backwash water uh, tank down to the uh, sanitary sewer pump station and back up to regional, but maybe actually doing a project that, you know, potentially puts that directly into the pipeline instead of going to uh, treatment. Um, that, do you have any water quality what would be water quality issues with the water in that particular well um, that would be detrimental that would need some sort of treatment as a raw yeah. water source, not a potable water source? Yeah, let me, uh, I'll, I'll get into all of that. I kind of want to just uh, you know, chime in and, and have my comments too. Uh, I totally agree uh, and, and have a, a real appreciation for 
this partnership with what we have with the reclamation users. I have done my homework and my research, and I understand the, the old history before ports existed in that relationship. So I totally understand and get and appreciate this, uh, re this relationship that we have them with uh, the reclamation users. Um, I can, we know, David, in my short time as being the operations manager, um, you know, we have seen, you and I have seen uh, uh, both extremes here. Uh, we've seen the ex a couple of times now where the extreme where ports is in jeopardy and there's not enough water and how we're going to get get uh, get to the end of the season. We've seen the other uh, extreme where ports is so so full that we've had to go out to the reclamation users and ask them to take every drop of water they can possibly take, you know, to help us out. So it is definitely a working relationship. That's why I feel so motivated to do everything we can within our within our means to. Uh, to bridge this gap this year. None of us here at TUD, David, uh, you know this as well as I do. None of us are the types of people who are faced with a challenge and just shrug our shoulders, throw our hands up in the air and move on, right? Now we're gonna, we're gonna work hard. We're gonna find a way as best we can to find a solution to these problems that we're having. And uh, like we did in 2014 and 15, or 15 and 16, whatever years those were, you know, we, we quickly put into action. We all understood, hey, we've got some some wells that, that uh, we acquired over all the years with the acquisition of some of these water systems. We have some of these wells that came along with them that uh, for one reason or another aren't being used anymore. Well, how can we put this into the system uh, to uh, to help bridge this gap? And, you know, not for me, not having a full, complete understanding of how much water the reclamation use, users use over that period of time, but I just knew that we had some of this water and it might as well go to beneficial use. Yes, it costs us a little bit of power, a little bit of man manpower, uh, man hours to run these things, but hey, uh, it's worth the effort in my mind. So, you know, off the top of my head, we, you know, obviously you mentioned the racetrack well, it can put out, I've been, Rich has some data uh, to give us some, uh, as far as flow volumes goes, but you know, we had, the racetrack was traditionally a good producer, but it had some water quality issues. So it was no longer potable unless we did some treatment, uh, which would be very expensive, or we did some sort of a blending. So it just was never used it for potable reasons, at least in my 21 years. Same thing out there currently the country of states uh, and a number of other wells out in the system. So that coupled with the water that's coming from, uh, you know, the backwash at Sonora Water Treatment Plant, historically, uh, that that water always went to you know pump back up to the, the clean the set, set of water but back up to the ditch for use. But now you know we can we can operate it to either we can send it to the collection system or we can send it to the ditch. So uh, yeah, um, as far as your question about developing a policy, I, you know I'll, I'll look into that if we really want to develop a policy, a formal policy. I'll work with the managers and Jesse to see what it would take to develop a policy, but. I, I think uh, more of a, a practice uh, that we build into the operation maintenance of both the collection system and the, the treatment system and the, rec and the outfall system of, of practice in, of how we, uh, we, we operate um, this system depending on if we have too much water or too little water. So I don't know. I went on and on there. Did I answer anything or provide any more information for you? That's not as like I said. Rich has some data on on how much water we brought into the system this year. Very early on, in back in April, I think it was April or May. I met with the, the former uh, reclamations coordinator who is no longer with us. He left uh, suddenly here uh, a little, some time ago. I met with him and and Rich. I said, you know, we're going to be in trouble, and so. I, we began introducing this, uh, I'll call it foreign water. It's a new wor word I've heard here recently, foreign water into the system, meaning these well waters, way back in April or May. And I'll, I'll stop there and let Rich kind of take over and let us know, you know what effort we have done and, and what kind of volume we're talking about. Go ahead, Rich. Thank you, Don. Um, so actually the, the data that I have um, started in about uh, March, March 17th, we started uh, running the racetrack well. Shortly after that, um, I think March 30th, we started running the country estates well. Um, and let me, let me give you the big number. The big number is um, since March, we have put in approximately um, 25 million gallons into the system, which is around 77 acre feet. Um, 
So then I can now I can break it down. Um, so for instance, the racetrack well, um, it's we're running it right now about 77 gallons a minute for 12 hours a day. So since March, we put in from that racetrack well um, about six million gallons. Um, from the uh, country estates well, which goes into uh, our Damon lift station out in Columbia, um, we're running that at around uh, 30 gallons a minute um, for 12 hours a day. We put in 1.5 million gallons um, from that well. Um, we're also dumping in some water from um, the Greenlee plant. We've been doing that for about three weeks now at about uh, 92 gallons a minute. Um, we had it lower, we've raised it. So I kind of average it out to about 92 gallons a minute, which is about 2.5 million gallons um, from that. And then um, the, as Don mentioned, the Sonora water treatment plant contributes Damn. about 90,000 gallons a day. So Gosh, since, since, um, since April, um, 163 days, it's been about 14, 14, 15 million gallons that have com come from the uh, Sonora water treatment plant. So all that adds up to approximately, like I said, about 25 million gallons. So um, I have a right. question if I could. Sure. Go ahead, Dr. So um, who is paying for the power to run those well pumps? As you mean, um, as yes. far as like ratepayers or um, because ob obviously we're paying for it, but um, are you talking about the like certain ratepayers? No, I'm yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I want to know who's who's putting the bill to run those those wells and how much money is it? And it's probably going to be next to impossible for Steve Sheffield to break that out. But I just want to make sure that people understand that um, uh, TUD is stepping up to the plate here, because I think I know the answers to my questions, but um, uh, this is expensive. Yeah, so I, I kind of misunderstood your question a little bit there. Um, yeah, so TUD is, is, flipping, is flipping the bill for that. And um, yeah, it... it um, it does cost money to run those pumps. Um, Greenlee doesn't have a pump involved, but um, the other two um, cost money. Um, uh, we're also getting some money from the, uh, not money, I'm sorry, some um, water from the Cedar Brook tank. Um, so that would, um, that's a well out there. So yeah, so I mean, uh, we are, you know, it does cost money to, to do this, but um, you know, we're trying. So for sure. So, and, and, and also too, I understand that, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, you would know better than I, or at least uh, Don Perkins would, is that uh, Mill Villa pump uh, well is a very productive one, but it was fired up and ran for a while and then broke. And now, TUD, I believe, if I've got my figures correct, is stepping up to the plate for $200,000 to get that thing renovated and back online. Is that correct? That's correct, David. I, I did totally jump up right over your initial question to me about the status of the Mill Villa Well, so I, I guess I should uh, jump in there and talk to you a little bit about the Mill Villa Well. So, yeah, uh, Director Ringman, you're correct. Uh, that, that well is a good producer. It has a safe yield of about 180 gallons per minute. The, the, the neat side part about that well is it has a pocket of water down there the size of about 1,500 acre feet of water, right? So there's a big void down there, big cavern down there that, that, that holds, we think, about 1,500 gallons of minute be, that you can pull out of there before you need to get down to the 180 GPM uh, safe yield. Now, those figures I just talked about, that's from a, a well test we ran in the late 90s, early 2000s, late 90s. So that's that. It has a 75 horsepower pump, right? 
So that's expensive to run. And Director Boatwright, you're asking about, you know, how we can get water where, and it's really unique up there. Uh, you can, you can pump water right into the distribution system if the water quality allowed it, which it doesn't. You can, we now have a treatment plant up there, uh, but before the treatment plant existed, 2015 or 16, we would pump directly to the tank up at Mill Villa then use it out that way. Um, but today, right, we have a new treatment plant up there, which, you know, we use, we've only used the one time in the back in the last drought. So, but today we can pump water into what, what we have a backwash tank and then grab it out of the backwash tank and down into the collection system. And then of course it's got to go through the mill villa sewer lift station to get back up to the plant. Well, I guess the only thing I want to tag on to what my comments or questions or whatever you want to call them is it ain't like TUD ain't doing nothing. We're busting rear end. All right, uh, Mr. Ringan, uh, Mr. Sheffield had his hand up for a couple minutes. Yeah. That's all right, no rush. I was just gonna respond to, and to contribute and hopefully clarify. Uh, first of all, you know, like, like Director Ringan said, all of us here are working really hard to look at what available options do we have. I count on these guys to say, can we use some backflow water? Can we get more water? Can we get, you know, how can we help out the ranchers? How are we gonna do this and everything else? So, you know, to me, this is just an example uh, of what they're doing and how they're doing it. It wasn't necessarily in my line item budget, but you know, each day brings us a new excitement, a new challenge, and we respond to it. But I will say, Director Ringan, you should know me better than that by now. I track everything. And so if you wanna know, I mean, we track every single utility electricity hookup we have through TPPA and through uh, PG&E. So we have, we can tell you exactly how much power and how much cost each one of these wells uh, will cost us when we're all said and done. But we, we literally track it down to that detail. And yes, TUD is paying for all of this, but uh, I do have that information and, and we can do kind of a summary after we get through this drought, just like we always do. And hopefully the rains come, but uh, yeah, just so you know, we, we do track it and I can get that to you. I know, I know, and I and I appreciate that, Steve. Um, and I know because I go through the claim summary every single month, and I see that it's all broken down. I do not want you to have to do that for two reasons. One, you already have too much on your plate, and number two, I don't want to get sick. I mean, I don't want to know that figure. I know it's going to be huge. Because I look at the electrical bill from both PG&E and TPPA, and uh, when you add them together, it's horrible. A, a ton of TUD money goes out for power. So please don't don't spend your valuable time doing a process like that. Because I don't need to know. Besides that, I don't want to get uh, a sick stomach. Um. Mr. Ringan, I have one additional comment question, um, just to assure. Um, Mr. Sheffield, um, are you able to make sure that the increased cost, <clears throat> i.e., do these facilities have a separate meter that uh, wastewater be, would be picking up under O&M? You know, every, every connection we have has its own meter. Those meters are tracked and they are assigned if it is dedicated to water or wastewater. Uh, it just depends. In this case, we're kind of using it for two, you know, we are using it for reclamation directly, but some of these other ones that Don and Eric have mentioned may be combined, you know, like obviously the Sonora treatment plant has to backwash. So that one's going to go through the water on here, but some of these newer ones, uh, we'll lack at and we charge it and account for it to the best of our ability. Okay. We have uh, um, Nathan's hand up with a comment, I believe. On you, the know, um, it, you know, I'm definitely leaning towards, um, you know, this, this sounds like we need a, a direct policy um, that would cover this. Uh, obviously there would be some cost 
um, a, there will be a meeting. Um, there's cost associated with that. That <clears throat> you know, a, it would take the whole board to actually vote on it to see if uh, that cost should be borne by the collection system, sanitary sewer collections uh, customer uh, through our rates, or if you know this was a <clears throat> sole sourcing um, you know, benefit to the reclamations um, partnership. And, and you know, the, therein lies where, you know, we're gonna have you know, emotions and you know, I, we're gonna talk this thing all the way through. We may talk about this thing very loud at times uh, and, and that's perfectly acceptable. Um, hey, I don't think that um, any supplemental water through this policy, and I'm getting way ahead of the, the wheels going down the track here, would have the same cost associated, you know, with IE pulling water from a ditch, you know, down from Lyons. Um, I think it should have, you know, if we need 200 acre feet and have to do a project, uh, you know, and we're able to pull that, you know, easily from the Melvilla well, uh, potentially. Um, you know, what does it cost for us to do that, um, you know, per acre foot? And, and February, um, you know, or March uh, reclamations luncheon, you know, that, that's where we discuss, hey, uh, this is a water level we're at. We need to introduce, you know, X number of acre feet to balance the system <clears throat> and avoid um, certainly a lot of manpower to guide. Sorry. If I can, I have apologies for the phone ringing. Um, <clears throat> yeah, they have a mind of their own. Um, <clears throat> you know, it, this is where we would introduce it. You know, we need this number of acre feet to bring into the system uh, to make sure that we're not paying the manpower costs to move the water around from the TUD side. Certainly, uh, Mr. Rosasco or Mr. Gardella may be able to contribute information on the extra manpower that they're having to put out, um, you know, in guiding and dealing with this water. Um, so it, that, that's where I would lean, that we want to, you know, make sure we have a, you know, guided policy for our reclamation system. That, uh, Mr. Ringan, um, do you have any other? I had my hand up, David. Nope. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. Nathan, I was letting you finish I, before um, I caught on. I kind of got that blended. Uh, Mr. Rosasco, go ahead. Yeah, a couple of things I wanted to point out was, and I, I'm agreeing with this, that we do need to some develop some kind of a policy. Um, because policies are something that the board can look at and the, and the actual TED can look at and, and follow. It, you know, we've been kind of, running by the seat of our pants there. And, and I want to make people perfectly clear, guys like John Gardell and myself and people in the upper zone have been using this water for 40 years. You know, we've, we've developed businesses that revolve around this water. So, and trust me, I've been through many droughts and we were through the drought in 1990. We've also were through the drought in 2014. So we've dealt with the droughts. And I'm appreciative of what TUD is trying to do. One of the problems I have, though, you're running too, a little too late this time of year to try to make up. You know, I point out to people all the time, we had, I use myself personally, I could use up to 500 acre feet of water a year in, in my system alone. You guys provide a hell of a lot of water. The actual agricultural water that goes out to the dish customers is around 500 acre feet. So, the major user for agricultural use in this county actually comes off of this reclamation system. That's not, I'm not talking about just general ditch use. I'm talking about agricultural use on the ditch, okay? So one of the problems that I had with the, the contract with uh, Miwoks at the golf course was, you guys all know there's an upper zone and a lower zone. John Gardell and myself and some other, small, other users are on the lower zone. The upper zone, correct me if I'm wrong, runs directly off the plant during the summertime, all right? 
So those people in that upper zone, when you sign that contract with the Miwoks, they're going to be directly impacted. You know, you store water in courts for John and myself and the other users. I don't, I can't think right off the hand who the other users are. So we are kind of security. That's our courts is our security blanket. But when you dig into that upper zone water, you take it from a lot of customers who have been there a long time. And I know Benny McCray and Betty West and those people, they've been there since the beginning. In fact, I think they were there before we were. If I'm correct me if I'm wrong, if the history is right. Because I believe they were served off of the Smith ditch and then it was transferred over to the reclamation system. So it's going to be a big impact. I know it's down the road, but right now, in order to keep the lower zone going, you're stealing out of the upper zone. So you got people like Benny and some of those people, they're not happy with us because we're taking part of their water. And I understand we got to, what do they call it? Share the pain, understandably, but they're not happy about it. And I remember at the meeting back in 2015, and there was some very unhappy people in that upper zone. And I don't like to get pitted against them, right? And so it goes back to another thing I would like to ask Eric. Will you guys talk about having courts completely full? When was the last time courts was actually completely full? I believe that with the reclamation, the way we've been using with conservation, and that's the other thing I'm going to bring up. I heard your comments on Saturday, Don and, and Eric on the radio, and I would like to add it in there. Yes, there's been a lot of conservation to slow down some of the water usage, but one of the other things that's been done is you've raised the price of water. And anybody here knows you raise the price of water, you slow down your usage. So that's also been an effect on what has happened here. So I don't think, I think we're in pretty good shape of ever having to overflow the system. Three years ago, we had a 40 inch rainfall year. The pond didn't fill, correct? And so I think that's, that's why I think we do need to sit down with the users, particularly on the outfall system and get a, and develop a policy because I think at some point in time, you guys are gonna have to make and make a decision on winners and losers who you're going to be able to provide water to and who you can't. Anybody that's in a business like mine, I can't go into the middle of late summer and go, okay, well, now I'm out of water. i got several hundred head of cattle, no different than anybody else that has to survive off of it, right? And if I don't have the green feed, it goes to speeding out hay. And let me tell you what hay is right now. The last hay I priced it was $285 a ton, Okay. So it is a major impact on us. And I'm not complaining. I'm grateful for what we've got. But we need to make plans. We need to look at this system and figure out what you guys can on a normal year, on a dry year, and on a wet year will have. And then we can make a policy that we can develop a plan. And then everybody can sit down and get it figured out whether they're going to literally have water to last them through the end of the year. Uh, I think when, when Ron brings up the cost of those wells that you guys are putting in there, I don't think anybody, and, and I will tell you this myself, I can only see, speak for myself personally. If you came to me in April, March or April, and said, we're going to run short, I might just say, hey, you know what? Let's, I'll help buy the water to put into the system. I mean, because that, that's how critical it is to me. Right now, I'm buying water, as you know, Don, I'm buying water and I'm pumping water to keep my side of the system running. Okay. So, I mean, I'm right now, I'm not living just off reclamation water. I'm living about 50% of the water that I'm using right now is coming out of what I'm paying for. And unfortunately for the other guys like John or the people up in the upper zone, they don't have that ability. I happen to have the ability to pull ditch water and I have a couple wells that are probably, you know, maybe, 150 gallon a minute wells that I can pull on. I can't pull on a full time. So those are some of the things that I wanted to bring up. You know, one of the things that happened to us this year, no fault of TUD, we didn't have a spring meeting. Okay. So we didn't have the ability for everybody to sit down. We should have Zoomed a meeting. Have everybody sit down and go, hey, we're going to probably run. I had to keep asking. And I asked Caleb about April, I said, what's the deal? What's the reservoir? Where are we at? I suspected we were going to run short. Those are the times when you could, if we're looking around and historically we know we're going to run short, we can supplement the system. 
Okay. I think it's possible. So I'll leave it at that. I don't think I had anything else in particular I wanted to mention. Nathan, okay. uh, yeah, thank you, Nathan. I, uh, I very much appreciate this, uh, this conversation. I can envision uh, some sort of a committee that we all get together, uh, a couple of directors, a couple of managers, and a few of the, uh, you know, the, the reclamation we sit down and we figure this out because uh, again i definitely personally definitely and i'm sure we all i speak for a lot of us here we appreciate the relationship we have with you and uh that's why we work as hard as we do even if it's behind the scenes without any fanfare just trying to bridge this gap now uh i i i knew like i was saying earlier this is why i met with uh you know caleb who you just mentioned i met with rich and we all knew we're going to meet we're going to be short here and I directed Caleb to go meet and come, you know, because we weren't going to have this meeting and, and ask you guys how you wanted to handle this season. So I was in the impression he did meet with you. It sounds like he didn't communicate at all, which really disappoints me. That's on me. That, that is on me. And I will take full responsibility of that. And we, that won't happen again. We'll meet Zoom. You know, like you said, we'll figure out a way to meet. So anyway, yeah, if, it, if it's a, Bonafide policy we want to develop. I'm all for it. We'll we'll meet with uh, managers and and uh, board members and committees and meet with Jesse and figure out how we can get a policy for him. So thank you for all of your comments, uh, Nathan. Appreciate it. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Rosasco. Um, Mr. Ringan, um, any comments? Um, nothing other than um, what I believe. Um, the point of these comments, and that is, let's try to figure out a workable policy that keeps our act people in business and doesn't break the back of TUD. Very good. That, yeah. uh, any other public comment or um, other staff members? One thing I didn't make clear in my comments, uh, trying to answer some of Nathan's comments, that yes, courts did fill so much so that we had to build a temporary dike to stay in compliance. I had a, we had a letter drafted uh, to send to whoever we need to, to say that we're going to have to release into Woods Creek without a permit. So that it did happen. Uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think it's now happened twice in my short time as this operations manager. Is that correct, David? We built that dike, dike twice uh, in um, the last six or seven years. Let's see. In 2011 um, was one, uh, I recall, as far as rented uh, rain for rent pipe. And then I want to say, even though it was a drought period, it was carryover water that led us into, I believe, 2014 um, was the last uh, peak time of the reservoir elevation. Um, okay. Yeah, it, it'd be a matter of records check. Um, <clears throat> certainly the best resource for that would be the sanitary or Sonora Regional uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, report. Uh, it tracks uh, quartz level, referencing those back in, you know, <clears throat> April of each year, you know, going back would be an easy way to track in exactly where the reservoir started uh, season. But, uh, okay. Mr. Rosasco, hand, hand up again. Well, somebody else wanted to see time in. If I got a chance, uh, you know, I guess I show my age because I went through the whole, we have way too much water. Mm -hmm. I got those March calls from Don Nestle saying, you got to get rid of water. And I said, where Don, it's too wet. The whole purpose of what the whole system and I, and, and look, when McCulloch was here, general manager, I went beat this horse over the head. I don't know how many times you got to have enough outfall system to take up your wet years. But if you don't have a system where you can actually continue to operate through the dry years, you're not going to have the wet year system. And as simple as that, you know, so if it means you have to try to supplement or augment that water during those drier years, that's what you got to do. But we, you know, <laughs> I say this, this is a conversation, Eric, I think you know that I've, I've been on this thing for years on this, trying to say, 
Yes, I understand they're going to have the dry years, but in order to have that, and you guys through TUD, let me tell you what, when TUD was spilling into Woods Creek, it brought the wrath of God down on my operation because I ended up with a 38 foot reservoir that got taken offline that I've never got to use again. And why did that happen? Because you guys were spilling into Woods Creek and the state came up here and look, we've had monitoring wells. I mean, we all we did is just bring up a huge pile of you know what. So, you know, we got to work together because I took the, you know, I lost a reservoir that we can't put back online without $100,000 worth of investments, probably more than that. So we've just left it empty. Okay. So these are things that we all have to work together and communicate with, you know. So I don't believe anymore that with, when we take the, David can correct me, Mr. Bowright, once we took the reservoir down to the proper level in the wintertime, you know, but by wintertime, we aren't going to have that fill up problem. Our problem was we were not getting the reservoir down far enough going into wintertime. Now that we're getting it down far enough, I don't think we're going to run into that huge problem. And I think you guys smoked out a lot of the problems through your system in Sonora where you were getting huge influx of rainwater into the system. I think that was one of the main things that helped alleviate that overflow. Am I correct on that? Absolutely. But uh, very, very good points, Mr. Rosasco. And I like the way you, you, you put that, that we will never have a wet season system for use uh, if we don't support it in the dry drier years. Um, very well put. That, uh, and I concur with Mr. Ringan that uh, I would, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, like to see us uh, pursue a policy that, uh, you know, guides us through uh, for a reclamation system. You know, um, David, I just uh, to address um, Nathan, um, you've been consistent, Nathan, all along, and I think you have a good understanding of the challenges. Certainly, you know your challenges better than we do, and you have a good understanding of our challenges as well. Um, I'm wholeheartedly um, in favor of, if it's not a policy, it's something that's a guiding document, because as a business owner, you don't like unknowns. TUD, as a public agency that's beholden to the regulations, we don't like unknowns. Uh, I think a compromise, something that, you know, is about, I think someone said balance several times is a great idea. I'm totally in favor. And, and I think I see two avenues, right? One is you got to support the, the wet years um, in order to have a dry year system. I totally agree with that. So having um, the ability to turn on and off lands is one approach and that's not really fair to you as a business owner if the district owned its own land then that's on us then we assume that risk and that's fine the other approach is to supplement the system and you know the best time to supplement the system is really right before irrigation season starts when we have spill water from lions lions you know earliest end to spill on record um early june june 7th um so you know, in between when irrigation season starts on April 15th and the end of spill, let's say the beginning of June, is when you have that water available. You top quartz off at that time. I'm just talking out loud here. And then you've got a beginning point of quartz that provides you and all the reclamation users um, the knowledge of this is the kind of season we're going to have. We manufacture the season at the beginning. The, the only issue, you know, about supplementing water after the end of spill, if it's surface water, that's some valuable, valuable water, and that passes risk on to our domestic users. But if you do it in that time period up to the end of spill, and you do it earlier in the season, then we're not chasing our tail at the end, you know, and, and you have quartz at a known point beginning the season. And if we still are running short, at least you know um, what we need to do going in into the rest of the of the season. So that's just my comment, but I totally respect and and acknowledge you've been consistent in what you've been saying. And so I think it would be good for us to get this on paper so we aren't having the same conversation over and over again. Hmm. Hopefully that was respectful. I was just, you no, know. No, I, I'm, all, I'm all with it, Eric. I We've worked over the years on this stuff. 
you know, I, I was hoping by this time we'd have some of this stuff figured out. But you know what? It, you know what? You guys have a system that's in flux always. And so I, I know that with the new plant coming on, and I, I understand one of the things that you're going to deal with is this newer quality, higher quality water. I understand that, you know. And so I, I when I saw you guys do the 300 acre fit, you know, availability to me walks out of the golf course that I understood the reasoning. What I didn't understand was nobody reached out to current users and said, this is what we're thinking of doing. What do you think? You know, and I've been a customer, you know, or a user, I should say, for you guys for 40 years. There was a little bit of me that said, really? You could have come back and called us in and said, hey, what are you thinking? You know, and, yeah. I, and I honestly, I really worry about it because it, I'm worried about the upper zone. You know that because they're the ones that are going to get affected. I don't think it's going to affect us as much as you. Well, I'll be honest with you. Valid concern. Um, good point. Uh, we should have should have had a conversation with you guys so you weren't caught off guard. I will say though that contract was written in a way that could it, they could be phased in so that it didn't have an impact to lower zone or upper zone. We're under no obligation to serve them reclamation water, so we could literally choose to just serve them reclamation water in a really wet year whenever, but when there was excess and there isn't, doesn't appear to be excess very often anymore, but I do have to believe that 20 years from now, we're going to live in a world that may have a 60 inch rainfall year now and then, you know, I mean, yeah. we're moving towards a drier climate, but that doesn't mean that the one-off those, those intense years and the variability in the climate isn't going to increase and we got to design for that too so um i you know we can talk offline because i know this is a hot button subject about the golf course but it really can be phased in um a little bit at a time to that golf course so that we aren't burdening existing customers uh in in the reclamation system i agree it appears we lost uh mr ringan again but, um, but uh, you know, I do believe we're all in agreement, um, you know, and certainly we can debate the details of the, the contract that, you know, it, that contract exists. Uh, both parties are, you know, bound to the agreement in it. Um, so I don't think those are so much the details of where this policy would go, <clears throat> um, because I do feel that that is a component. Um, Certainly the acreage that that contract represents is a big component of the wet season, you know, years uh, where there is a large amount of reclamations water. Um, but in the drier years, uh, that's where the policy will direct and, you know, come up with a way to make sure that the system's balanced. But, uh, um, Corey, uh, any possibility you could contact Mr. Ringens if he's going to be able to come back? Um, I think we're at a point where we're winding this down. Um, yeah, let me see if I could get a hold of him uh, on the side. Hold on just a moment. Well, we'll you know, uh, one thing I'll add while he's okay. doing that is... Uh, Look, all of our contracts, nobody's committed to you guys providing us with water when you're out. You know, we're, I'm, I'm well aware of that, you know, just like, and it, actually, if you look, read the contracts, it favors you guys more than me because it pretty much tells me I need, I, I am obligated to get rid of water. <laughs> so, but there was nothing in the contract that said you were obligated to provide me water when it wasn't there. So that's why I've always tried to work within the system because I understand, you know, I mean, those contracts are kind of more of a burden to me than they are to you. And I appreciate the fact that you guys have, have tried to work and make sure that we, we get through these dry years. Okay. So that's something that, you know, I've read the contract more than once back to I, I had Don Nestle call me up one day and tell me he was going to take over my system in the middle of a heavy winter to, to, to put out water. And it, it was not a good conversation. It didn't go well, you know, because we all know that he couldn't have ran the system out uh, out here at my place because he didn't know it. So, you know, but they were up against the wall. You guys were up against it and trying to get rid of water. I understand. You know, looks like Ron just reconnected. 
I did. I'm getting sick and tired of cell phones. When can we start meeting in person again? <laughs> Good God. Uh, I think we were, were mandated to do that after September 30th. Um, they, there, there's been no, they are, okay, that's a tangent. Mr. Perkins, has there been any new regards to answering Mr. Ringan's question? Uh, I think new, you're correct. Uh, I don't know the details. Abby's on. She can probably chime in here and give us the, the legalities of what happens after September 30th. But, but, but before I give it over to her, uh, I'd like to know before I, we lose uh, Director Ringan, uh, Director Bowright, how do you see the next time we meet uh, and, and discuss them? Who, who do you want there? And uh, how do you want it? You in person, out in the field? Um, you know, certainly, I, I think at the current moment, the, the board, <clears throat> you know, the majority of the board is still going with the Zoom meetings. Um, I would say sometime two to three weeks uh, from now, a, another wastewater committee. And <clears throat> is it a, you know, brainstorming uh, where we put all the ideas down on paper to we have a title of the policy that we're developing and then filling in the blanks. Uh, certainly all of the stakeholders at the table, our reclamations partners, our wastewater committee and staff uh, for input and see if we can come up with a draft. Um, like I said, Mr. Ringan and myself, we were kind of, okay, how do you make a policy? Um, you know, that, uh, so for myself, I'm going into new territory. Um, but I think, you know, we can all take a little bit of time, mull it over. And, um, you know, like I said, I think it should kind of be a fill in the blanks and drafting and developing it. And then eventually it will end up going before the full board to uh, adopt and implement. Okay. Nathan, how do you see it? Do you see uh, uh, having a couple of representatives of the uh, reclamation users upper and lower zone so they can be uh, felt like they've got their thoughts and ideas on the table as well? Yeah, and I always concerned that I don't, you know, just because myself and, and John are the bigger users, I always want to make sure that these guys on the upper zone get represented. I always, I think Benny McCray would probably be more than glad to be involved. In if there's other people, you know, one of the conversations that we've had on there is you guys got a ton of really small users in that upper zone. And I, you know, when we have those meetings, sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. I think it's, I think it's something that's going to have to be fleshed out. That's why I made the comment. You know, there may be some winners and losers in the system. Maybe you got to figure out that some of those little small users are, is, and what worries me is that they don't have another alternative for a water source up there because of what now is the Swiss Smith dish got turned off years ago. What do they have, right? Yeah. You know, but I don't want to see anybody get cut off. I wouldn't want to get cut off myself. Yeah, but, no. you know, that, so I think you got to at least make it available for some of those people to be involved. Okay. Yeah, uh, certainly to make sure that they're all aware. Uh, I know our agenda isn't posted, but, you know, make sure that they're aware of, you know, hey, this is a policy on reclamations we're talking about. But uh, they may join us here in Zoom uh, or in person. Uh, yeah, when... Can I ask Eric a quick question? Um, is, is the Egan, do you guys even use any of that anymore? Or what's basically it's offline is that true uh, that's correct go ahead, go ahead yeah, Bell, right you know yeah there, there was an aluminum pipe we're talking about egan ranch yes uh, uh yeah there was an aluminum pipe system out there and i think in 20 you know like i said 2014 comes to mind uh, we did put water out there and put it out through an aluminum pipe system. Uh, I believe that was the same year that we were using uh, some property on Mr. Gardella's ranch as well, too, with the run system. Okay. So do you visualize ever using that? As, is that what you guys envision? They're going to try to make it something that's just a, an excess usage type of deal? <clears throat> uh, I, you know, as far as any future use of Egan Ranch on my part would be speculation. Uh, Mr. Perkins, is that not um, 
also one of the pieces of property that's listed on the surplus? Uh, no, it's not currently listed on the surplus property, uh, but it's cert we're certainly thinking about listing a surplus. I don't know the, the history either, because that obviously is way before my time when we purchased it and the reason for purchasing, purchasing it and all that. But what I think I understand is we paid a fair amount of money on, I don't know, 80 acres of land just for this reason, right? It made sense, except with all of the this and that, the setbacks and the restrictions, there's really not enough usable land out there that we actually apply water to to make it worth our while. That's my summation of that. So we again, we paid a fair amount of money for a piece of property we really can't utilize. And even in, and they, it had to be after 2015 because we did that when I was the operations manager. So it was either 15, 16, 17, one of them years where we, yep, we rented some more, uh, spent, I don't know, $30,000 ring for rent equipment so we can sprinkle, you know, what, nine acres of water. Just trying to get rid of every drop. So, all right, um, Abby, quick yes or no on new regulations for September thirtieth. Nothing has changed since the executive order eight twenty one that was signed on June eleventh, stating that the authorization to conduct virtual meetings without the normal Brown Act postings um, were expiring by September thirtieth. So. Anything following that would need to be an open public in-person meeting, or if someone was joining virtually, one of the board members was joining virtually, they would have to post the location that they'll be joining the meeting from, and that location would have to be open to the public. Okay. All right, so after September 30th, at this moment, we're going back to live in-person for board members. That, uh, but I think that doesn't mean we can't have a work group, an ad hoc committee who, who can correct. meet without it being an, an agendized meeting. That's correct. Anytime okay. there would be a quorum of the board, three or more. Okay, so anytime there's a quorum, it has to be in person. Uh, committees are then still able to meet through Zoom? Uh, that is my understanding, but I will double check before we break. This item will be coming before the board again, um, I believe, on the September 14th meeting so that we can discuss it further, and I will make sure I know the answer to that question. Okay. Very good. Um, I, I'm satisfied that we've chewed this up. We have some direction we want to go. Uh, Mr. Ringan, um, are you at the same point? Yeah, I, I really am. And I just want to make sure that um, I throw out that um, we keep the uh, meetings, whether they be committee, board, or whatever, as early in the day as possible um, for many reasons, but mostly so that everybody's bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and ready to deal with the issues that we have to deal with, because we've got a lot of them, and a lot of them are really stickly. And um, I want to make sure that um, we're making positive progress as we move forward, because time is of the essence. We have so many things on our plate right now it's ridiculous, and um, I don't want us to lose track of them and and um, uh, let things slip through the cracks. And also, if we get the meeting over first thing in the morning, it allows everybody to go to work and get their job done afterwards, uh, at least have a pro productive day. These things at 2 o'clock in the afternoon or 7 o'clock at night, that's nuts. I, that's just nuts. So that's all I got to say. I I, I want to thank everybody that's been on this um, at this meeting um, for how much ground we covered today. I think it was very valuable and a lot of good information got passed back and forth. So thank you. All right. Um, just as a general recap then, uh, discussion regarding Septage facility fees. Uh, Mr. Perkins, were you going to look into that, make sure that we are current with our current cost? We're going to do so and then report back to you. Yes. 
<clears throat> um, discussion regarding a groundbreaking. Um, we decided we'd like to have a groundbreaking and uh, that'll be towards the end of September. Correct, and we have a, when we have a firm date from Eric and his team, we'll, we'll report back to you. Uh, and thank you for the update on the operation and maintenance of reclamation system. And item four, um, moving forward with uh, developing a policy for augmentation of uh, reclaimed water so that we can have a wet season <clears throat> system that will, you know, needs a little bit of help in the dry years. But, uh, yeah, I think on that, I think uh, I'm going to work with staff here, develop a bunch of bullet points on statistics, uh, you know, going back in time and history of what we've had. Uh, we'll throw out all kinds of data on, on different ways to supplement water, this augment this water, uh, and uh, put all this stuff on, on a piece of information and schedule another meeting, uh, uh, whether it's a, a wastewater committee meeting or just a, an ad hoc committee meeting in two to three weeks. That sound about right? Yep, sounds good. So, uh, Nathan, are how how comfortable you with the information as far as uh, how this current season is going to end. Do you have any idea or are you comfortable with the information you have to know when we're going to run out of water at all? Do you well, at this point in time, I'm just kind of hanging on with whatever you send my way. <laughs> yeah, well, we're down to 8%. Uh, yeah. I, again, I didn't finish with the mill bill. Of, uh, it, it, it did blow a hole in the pipe, we think. We can't get the water out of the hole. Uh, we're going to do a condition assessment on that uh, and we'll know more later and then we're going to apply for a grant. So there's some opportunistic grants right available right now. We're working hard on to get that, that well re repaired. So that's well, the I, think, I, I think David has talked about it before and I, and I actually think his idea of dedicating the line over to the plant might be a, a future solution. I don't think it's going to do anything for us now, but I, I literally think that is a good idea. And, uh, you know, because I think, I think one of the things you guys have ran into, I, I know, I think in the past you were able to put water into the wood spigot and pick it up as a plant, but I think something that would make it available a lot easier. And we all know that fishing games got to be involved when it comes into dropping water into any waterway. So, um, I think that mill on a, in a long term in a short term, long term future, I think that mill, mill bill of well might be something that could really help us out. Yeah. Okay. okay. Like I said, I'll, we'll we'll collect all of this uh, all this information we've talked about and anything else we can come up with and organize a meeting and let's figure this thing out. <clears throat> Sounds good. All right. Very good. But uh, Mr. Ringan, I'm about to adjourn this meeting. Are you good with that? I am very good with that. I think it was very productive, and I want to thank everyone that participated once again. Um, this is what it takes everybody working together. All right, very good, thank you. Um, um, I will adjourn this meeting for the wastewater uh, committee at 1217 then. Everybody have a great day. Thank you, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Good work. Bye now. Bye-bye.